harassed him for years. It isn't pretty. And it's my subject on today's Fiamengo file. I'm Janice Fiamengo of the University of Ottawa. The complaint against Professor Avital Ronell offers a case study in female sexual bullying, academic feminist double standards, and the difficulties for men seeking equal treatment as victims. Avital Ronell is a professor of German literature and comparative literature at New York University. She is a specialist in the post-structuralist and psychoanalytically inflected cultural theory that literature departments have become known for over the past few decades, which claims to oppose fascism through verbal obscurity and meaninglessness. In a 2009 interview posted on YouTube, for example, Ronell can be found explaining that meaning, quote, has often had very fascistoid, non-progressivist edges, end quote. I'm very suspicious historically and intellectually of the promise of meaning because meaning has often had very fascistoid, non-progressivist edges, if not a core of that sort of thing. She claims to disapprove of the, quote, quick grasp for the transcendental signifier, and she claims to prefer instead the, quote, arbitrary eruption of something that can't be grasped or explicated, but is just there in this kind of absolute contingency of being. It's been very devastating, this, um, this craving for meaning though it's something with which we are in constant negotiation. Everyone wants something like meaning. But when you see these dogs play, why reduce it to meaning rather than just see the arbitrary eruption of something that can't be grasped or explicated, but it's just there in this kind of absolute contingency of being. Since approximately June of 2017, I, along with two other concerned academics, Peter Bergoshin and Helen Pluckrose, have been writing intentionally broken academic papers and submitting them to highly respected journals in fields that study gender, race, sexuality, and similar topics. We did this to expose a political corruption that's taken hold of the university. By this point, several of these papers have been accepted in highly respected journals, and one that claims that dog humping incidents can be taken as evidence of rape culture has been officially honored as excellent scholarship. I'm not going to lie to you, we had a lot of fun with this project. The, the reviewers are worried that we didn't respect the dog's privacy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the concern. We respected the <laughs> But don't let that lead you to believe that we're not addressing a serious problem. If you have a few minutes, I'll try to explain. She also advocates a, quote, politics of refusing that gratification, end quote, meaning the gratification of meaning, though. As we will see, her demands for gratification of other sorts seem to have been unceasing and remorseless. Earlier this year, in May of 2018, Professor Ronell was found by New York University in a Title IX investigation to have sexually harassed her former PhD student, Nimrod Reitman. For that, she received a one-year suspension. The former student, Reitman, is now launching a civil action against Ronell and New York University in which he alleges with many supporting documents that for three years, Ronell pursued and bullied him like a pathologically possessive lover, insisting on speaking to him at least every day in lavish terms of endearment and sexual implication while also threatening that if he failed to reciprocate, 
Anne failed to allow her access to his body and control over his time, she would make sure he never got the career he wanted. He claimed she groped and fondled him, forced him to touch her, and insisted at times on sleeping in his bed. Unless Ronell can mount an extremely convincing defense, the evidence Reitman has provided in the form of email and other messages shows his former supervisor to have acted like an emotional terrorist, unable to control herself or to act professionally. Of course, self-control and professionalism are just fascistoid bourgeois ideas based in a non-progressivist transcendental signifying system and lacking arbitrary eruptions. But seriously, the evidence Reitman has brought forward in his lawsuit is enough to suggest that Professor Ronell should never supervise a graduate student again. Another former teaching assistant of Ronell's, Andrea Long Chu, has published an article in the Times Higher Ed magazine to say that the described behavior is commonplace for Ronell, well known among graduate students at NYU, and in fact, not very remarkable in academia as a whole. In addition, Bernd Hupoff, the former chair of German at NYU, has written a scathing account of Ronell's totalitarian takeover of the department that hired her, which he claims she transformed from a respectable literature department into her own bullying fiefdom, in which anyone who disagreed with her theoretical approach or even failed to show the requisite enthusiasm would be rebuked, excluded, and humiliated. Perhaps Ronell's penchant for power plays explains the response of some of Avital's friends and colleagues, including gender studies superstar Judith Butler, a group of whom wrote a letter to NYU not only defending Ronell without knowing the nature of the charges, but also attacking Ronell's accuser, Reitman, whom they alleged was waging what they called a, quote, malicious campaign. Furthermore, they argued with predictable but still outrageous elitism that Ronell should be treated differently from other accused professionals in this kind of situation because she is a basically a wonderful woman with an international reputation. They wrote, quote, we testify to the grace, the keen wit, and the intellectual commitment of Professor Ronell, and ask that she be accorded the dignity rightly deserved by someone of her international standing and reputation, end quote. Their victim-blaming and perpetrator-excusing arguments break every rule in the feminist playbook except the one rule that we know governs all, that men are always guilty if accused, but feminist women only very rarely. A writer for Salon magazine basically made the same case, claiming laughably that Ronell's real problem was that she came of age in Paris during the 1970s when sleeping with younger men was a bohemian thing to do, not an abuse. Ronell is reported to have had an affair with Jacques Derrida's 16-year-old son when she was a student of Derrida's. The Salon writer actually goes so far as to declare it a profound sexist injustice that Ronell will now be known not for her supposedly brilliant writing, but for preying on a young man. The double standards are, of course, very evident. If a man had done to a young woman what Ronell certainly seems to have done to Nimrod Reitman, his career would be over. So, so far, so predictable. Unfortunately, the lawsuit also makes for dismaying reading because of what it reveals about the behavior of Ronell's accuser, Nimrod Reitman, whom it is difficult to champion as an innocent victim of Ronell. On his very first meeting with her just after his acceptance as a PhD candidate, but months before he moved to New York City, Reitman experienced her inappropriate attentions and did next to nothing about it. The lawsuit states that after they first met at a conference in Israel held in Ronell's honor, quote, Ronell began calling Reitman on his cell phone and on his parents' home phone in Israel, often insisting that Reitman speak with her for hours. Though the calls made him uncomfortable, Reitman did not want to alienate 
his famous and powerful new doctoral advisor and therefore participated in them. When Reitman returned to his residence in Berlin, he continued to receive telephone calls and requests for video calls from Ronell on a near daily basis. The calls would occur at all times of the day and night with Ronell demanding that Reitman remain on them for hours, end quote. And it went on and on. Here, we're asked to believe that a 26-year-old man was so intimidated by this woman's unwanted come-ons that he couldn't extricate himself. We're asked to believe that he was entirely in her power, even though he was living thousands of miles away at this point and bound by no legal contract or personal obligation. It seems he considered only once switching schools, but gave up the idea because the person he would have had to apply to at Yale University was purportedly a close friend of Ronell's. But Ronell is not close friends with every graduate admissions chairperson in every literature program in the United States, and there are dozens of reputable schools that Reitman could have chosen from. He could have made up a family excuse not to come to New York University with no irreparable damage to his career prospects. Instead, knowing that he was about to embark on a close relationship with a woman whose behavior was so far out of line as to constitute pathological obsession, still, he placed himself entirely in her hands. Throughout the complaint, many excuses are made for why Reitman continually complied with Ronell's near daily demands for three long years. We can only imagine that his friends and family must have begged him to save himself. Once again, we see the sickness of Me Too culture in the total abdication of responsibility on the part of the usually female, but in this case, male victim. The truth is that Avital Ronell never had the absolute power Reitman claims she had, but even if she did, he always had power too, the power to say no. Clearly, Reitman's complaint reveals, as we've known all along, that women can be at least as abusive, obsessive, selfish, lacking in empathy, and unethical as men are traditionally said to be. But it also reveals, in my opinion anyway, what happens to men in a feminized and feministic culture who live by that culture's terms? They end up entrapped by the victim myth and reduced by it. One of the most striking aspects of the lawsuit from my perspective is its observation that the Title IX investigation carried out by New York University did not use its usual lax standards of evidence when considering whether Ronell sexually assaulted Reitman. And here's the section in the lawsuit, quote, NYU also determined that because Reitman did not have corroborating witnesses, there was insufficient evidence to find that Ronell had engaged in sexual assault. By employing such reasoning for its determination and requiring that sexual assault allegations be corroborated by a third-party witness, NYU applied an evidentiary standard to the complaint of a male victim that has not been employed by the law in New York for more than 40 years and has never been applied by NYU to the complaints of a female victim, end quote. So... Surprise, surprise, the Title IX investigation employed a higher standard than usual to judge Reitman's complaint because Reitman is a man and his alleged abuser was a woman. In most cases, no corroboration for a claim of sexual assault is necessary. But rather than objecting to the low standard of evidence, the Reitman lawsuit wants it lowered for Reitman also. Why should he have to show evidence of sexual assault when Women don't have to show evidence. It's logical enough. But this aspect of the civil action stands as a metaphor for Reitman's case as a whole, which is, in my opinion, not really about justice or leveling the playing field. It's about lowering the playing field, admitting men into the victim game that women have been winning for such a long time. 
But the victim game is a contest for public sympathy that plays into women's particular strengths and weaknesses. And it's a game that men as a group can only lose, even if individual men may win some of their cases some of the time. If Reitman wins this case against Ronell, which it seems to me from what I know about the case, he should. His